And then we find the words in the lips of Jesus when he says in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, when they've been asking him about the great commandment, what do you say the great commandment is? And he said, the greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him with all your strength and all your might and all your mind, all your heart. All of you has to love God, worshiping him alone. That's the same teaching in Islam. I was glad that my friend didn't really try to turn this into a debate or an opportunity to condescend or make fun of us for some of the mistakes that maybe we had in our thinking. In fact, he was very gentle. And he told us, keep reading, keep thinking. But it wasn't long until I realized, really, what he said made better sense. But how could I be one of those Muslims? I don't think so. Yet the overwhelming evidence that I found in my own Bible, compared to the Quran, became clear to me, there really is only one God. But I never doubted that. And this is what I want to really emphasize, how important it is for us not to try to win a debate and drive somebody out of Christianity or any religion. No. Because if you did that, they might leave religion altogether. They might lose their faith altogether. And then what would they have? No, it's better to help them step up and step closer than to catch them off guard and throw them away. And that's usually what happens in these debates, isn't it? Another point about this, the way we present ourselves, present our material to someone, is for us to consider we're all human beings. If you're a Christian or a Jew, you agree. We all came from Adam, and from Adam came Eve. And from those two, all the humans, all the tribes and all the nations came from those two. Well, guess what? That's exactly what it says in the Quran, without any doubt. So, just like I don't want you as Muslims to be caught off guard, I don't want you to try to catch somebody else off guard and make them doubt, make them leave. We all need our faith. Good to sit together, learn together, grow together. Let's do this. Let's take a break. Think about what I was talking about. We'll come back and pick this up again and continue talking about this subject, God, Allah. Ah, <laughs> we're back from our break. We've been talking about the subject of God, and I want to share with you now an example of something that happened to me one time. Somebody asked me, why don't you guys, you Muslims, why don't you say God like normal people? Why do you say Allah? I said, well, first of all, normal people don't all say God. And normal people, even normal Christian people, don't necessarily use this word God, and many of them never even heard of it. They use words like, in Spanish, Dios, and Dios. in uh, French, and other languages have different words when they talk about the one creator and sustainer of the universe. By the way, if you were a Christian Arab, you would be using the word Allah because that's the word that they use. Whether they're Arab, Christian, or Arab, Jew, the Bible in the Arabic language uses the word Allah. On page one of Genesis, you find it 17 times. And by the way, you can prove what I just said for yourself. If anybody tells you that Allah has nothing to do with Christianity or Judaism, you can show them up real easy. All you have to do is go to any hotel or motel practically on the planet. And in the dressing table right next to the bed, the lamp table, just open the drawer and take it out. You'll find a Bible and turn six or eight pages and you're going to see examples of the translations to the various languages. I think they have 27 languages Gideon Society has produced and they've done a nice job. The first example they give you is the Afrikaans language from South Africa. And then the second one they give you is from the Arabic language. And the verse that they translate in all of these examples is the verse out of John 3, 16. And it starts out, for God is so loved the world. And in the Arabic, which is right there, it says, for Allah so loved the world. 
If Allah was not the correct translation, then why have all of these Bibles all over the earth have this translation of God into Arabic as Allah? And then there's another point. There was no English language until after the Normans invaded the Saxons in the year 1066 AC. It means nobody said the word God. No normal people said the word God before that time. Hmm. And that's only about 960 years ago, isn't it? Think about it. And then, think about this. That the language of Jesus was Aramaic, which is very close to the Semitic language of Hebrew and the Semitic language of Arabic. And what word do you think he used? And the word is Allah. If you get a chance ever to talk to somebody about the Aramaic language, you'll find that that is the word that they're using when they say Allah or God. But the concept of Allah is what's important even from a linguistic point of view. Because there is a word in Arabic for God. It's called Elah. And it comes from the same root as the one that you find in Arabic, El. Like Elohim. And Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabat, Tani, something that's attributed to Jesus in the Gospels. And then consider this. If somebody's telling you that Muslims worship a moon god called Allah, that's bizarre. That's preposterous. That's ludicrous. <laughs> and it's a lie. Because in the Quran, we find very clearly that the companions of Muhammad were asking about the moon itself. They wanted to know about the new moons and was there any superstition to it? Is there something about a new moon going in or out that they should be worshiping? And it says in the Quran in verse 189 in chapter 2 in Surah Baqarah, Yassalunaka. They're asking you, and that's a translation of that, they're asking you, O Muhammad, about the new moons. This is the question. And look what he said. It's nothing about superstition, nothing about worshiping them. He said these are nothing more than to indicate to you the months, the seasons, so you'll know when to perform, for instance, your pilgrimage or your hajj in the month of Dhul Hijjah. Well, now, if you've understood everything that I've just said, you realize that the Quran is against the worship of anything that Allah created. It's against worshiping anything that you can see or hear or touch or smell or feel. It consistently says the same thing, not to worship other than Allah. Allah tells us in the Quran who he is and who he's not. But we find the same thing in the Bible. An amazing statement in the Bible here is when Jesus in Mark 12, 29 is telling his followers about the greatest commandment. He said the greatest commandment is to know O oh, Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you have to love him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. Then we find the same thing in the Old Testament. This is in Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Go to chapter 6, and you're going to find that. Exact quote, again, Hear, O oh, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your might. And by the way, you can also find the same thing in Luke chapter 10, verse 26. Think about it. And then think about this and see how this settles with you. Here's something for you. It says, Allah, there is no God except Him, the living, the eternal. He doesn't sleep nor slumber, and to Him belongs everything that's in the heavens and the earth. Who is there? that can intercede with him, except that they would have to take permission from him in the first place. He knows everything. Backward, forward, up, down. He knows everything. His knowledge encompasses everything. And you have no knowledge except that which he gives you. His cursey, or chair, extends over the universe, and he never grows tired of guarding the heavens and the earth. He is the exalted, the supreme. Now, if you agree with that, if you said, well, that's what I believe about God, too. I think he is living and eternal. 
Well, you've only done this, you've only agreed with the Old Testament, said the same thing.